I'm going to continue this morning on the series that we started last week on rethinking vision. Just going to jump right on into this as people come back with your coffee, your donuts, your uh, breakfast tacos, hash browns. I'm hungry right now. For some reason, I'm just, I'm just, it just makes me hungry thinking about As they used to say in Georgia, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Just cut the onions, but, but, but I'm hungry nonetheless. I want to talk today, I just want to jump right into this. I'm, I'm talking about what we say. My title of my message is Speak Up. Go to Job, the 22nd chapter. I know some people shy away from the book of Job because they think that word means job. Yeah, but <laughs> Job 22, it's a, this is a portion of the, of the passage that we read last week. I just want to give you this one thing. Out of all of his comforters, Job did have a few people that spoke some truth to him. And this is a good statement that was given to Job in the midst of all of his trials. He said, you will declare a thing. This is the New King James Version. You will declare a thing, and it will be established for you, so light will shine on your ways. I like the NIV and the Amplified, and so I'll go to the NIV. It says, what you decide on will be done, and light will shine on your ways. And the Amplified puts it this way. You will decide, you will also decide and decree a thing. You'll declare it, you'll decree it, and it will be established for you And the light of God's favor, then, will shine on your way. So we see three things that happen to us as we see the vision. I talked last week about seeing the vision. Before you say it, you've got to see it. And when you see it, what happens is, number one, we decree. Number two, God establishes. And number three, favor comes. Right? Say it with me. Say, we decree. God establishes. And favor comes. I want to give you, I'm just, these are things that that, that seem to be linear, but they're not. I'm not really a linear type person. I'm, I don't know what I am. I just go down and come back up for the surface for air every now and then. But I, I, I like to give you points so that you know that at least I am going somewhere and I'm just not stuck on some thought and it helps me out. Let me give you the first statement that I have today, and that is that God has ordained that the words we speak have creative possibilities. God God has just simply ordained that. He put that in the beginning. What happened? God said, right, let there be light, and there was light. The Bible teaches us that the worlds were created out of the Word of God. God said. Now, I don't have the ability to create I, like that. I could not create another world. But God has given to me a world. He's given to me a dimension. He's given to me a realm, a dominion within his kingdom. And what I say is going to affect the outcomes around me and in the area of the realm of responsibility that God has given to me. Go to Matthew, the 17th chapter. I was just thinking about this this week. And uh, I came upon this uh, in remembrance, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to read this a little bit more closely maybe than I have before, because Jesus has been up on the mountaintop. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration because that was the place where he was transformed before uh, Peter, James, and John, and he had this conversation with Elijah and Moses, and then, uh, then they come down from this place of tremendous glory, they come down into the valley, and there is a demon-possessed child, and he delivers this little child of demons. And the disciples come to him, to Jesus in private. They were smart. They didn't ask in public. They're a little embarrassed because, see, they'd been working. Come out, come out, come out, and nothing been happening. You ever feel like that? (laughs) Go away, go away, and it stays there. Come, it doesn't come. And they said to him, Lord, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, 
Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, lest we load this up with a bunch of qualifiers, I just want to look at two things here. He says that when you look at that mountain, and many of us have mountains in our lives that need to be moved. We have, we have mountains of of generational curse we have mountains of problems we have mountains of stuff we have mountains that may be even be uh, uh, be people or people that we would uh, prefer uh, the people uh, not people but situations that are around us that people are involved in where stuff just needs to move have you, does anybody here feel like today that there ought to be something that just moves out of the way that's your mountain Jesus says that you will say to that mountain, you don't have to move it, you will say to it, and when you speak to it, when you speak to it, it will move. And then he likens it to mustard seed. And so there are, uh, so not only is he talking about saying, but he's talking about sowing. So I think that what God has given to us is an opportunity to make change in our situation. It, it, you know, sometimes we just we got to quit living with the, the stuff we're living with. And we've got to make a decision. How many of you know that? You know, the first thing of getting out of the rut is making the decision you're just going to get out of the rut. I hate to see people live aimless life. Do not live an aimless life, please. Not with all of the possibilities that are there. Not with all of the potential that is there. I see people in their 30s saying, I don't know if I can go on. 30 years old, get off your uh, posterior and move forward. You're not stuck. You're not old enough to be stuck. I remember one time I said, God, I give up. He said, you ain't started yet. <laughs> Nothing shall be impossible for you. So I put things into motion. And so when... Uh, so there's, there's something about it. When I speak a word toward the vision that God has given, I speak to that vision, I am sowing something into the atmosphere. I'm sowing something into that vision. I'm sowing. Just as when I give, I sow. You know, when I discovered that giving is sowing, it changed my whole attitude toward giving. Because the Bible, for instance, in the Old Testament, Leviticus, it says that the tithe belongs to the Lord. It isn't mine. So 10% of what I have, the first fruits, and you don't have to move that decimal point over. I'm just talking about the first fruits, that first thing that comes to you. It is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. Now, if you spend it, you spent God's money. So when it comes to, so, so when I discovered that, uh, well, I don't like that law. Uh, I wish the law were 3%. Or, you know what? It doesn't matter to God whether it's 5%, 15%, 20%, or 90%. It is the principle of sowing and reaping. When I discovered that, it changed my whole attitude. So every week, for instance, when Delia and I, we're moving toward our vision. See, we're moving toward that. The reason why I became a giver, we became givers, was we're moving toward the vision that God has put in my, our lives. David said, I've, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. He was faithful in the house of God, and because of that, he could claim blessing over his children. So I know my children are blessed. My grandchildren are going to be blessed because I have established a culture of giving, not only in giving of my substance, but also giving of my words. And that takes me to the next one here. And that is the greatest gift. I put it first, one of the greatest gifts, but let me call it the greatest gift. Let's go to this number two. The greatest gift that you can give, let's go to number two. Is it there? Okay. No, we're, we're on. We're on. We're, we're way beyond. Are we? No, back. Do we have a number two, the greatest gift? Yeah, we don't. Okay, y'all read, y'all listen to just jot this one down. <laughs> Whoever put this PowerPoint together messed up. That would be yours truly. I was on the, on the plane last night, and I missed this one. Where are we? Okay, the greatest gift you can give your family, church, or community, and world is to discover God's purpose in your life and begin moving toward that purpose. That is the greatest gift that you can give. I, I think it's the greatest gift. 
You know, I, I, sometimes I have looked around and I said, why is, my, you know, through the years, why is everybody downbeaten and sullen? And God says, because you are the leader and you're downbeaten and sullen. And, or is that a good word, sullen? Anyway, you're somber and so forth. You need to get a vision so you can pump hope into your family. Paul, you need to get a vision so you can pump hope into the church, hope into your community, hope into your world. Now, I know some people are down this week because of the election. Some people are up. Some people are down. Some people are hopeful, kind of like I am. I'm just going to tell you we need to pray for Mr. Trump. Just like four years ago, I said we need to pray for Mr. Obama. Eight years ago, I said we need to pray for Mr. Obama. Twelve years ago, we prayed for Mr. Obama. No, it was Mr. Bush. Well, was it Bush before that? I, I forget. And then before that, it was Eisenhower. But we need to pray. My, my little daughter, my little granddaughter is asking me, Papa, who are you going to vote for? Well, she's six years old. When I was six years old, I didn't even know who my teacher's name was, let alone the president of the United States. I said, who did you vote for? She said, I voted for Hillary. <laughs> I said, okay. She said, but I, did, I just, I just it, that was the only one that I knew. She said, so anyway, I thought she wasn't well educated on all of that. But <laughs> she voted for Hillary. So she's a little disappointed when Hillary didn't make. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to speak death and, and everything and disparity over our nation. I'm going to speak prosperity and blessing over our nation. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing that we did for Mr. Obama. Let's pray for him. Let's pray, number one, oh, God, help us that anybody who won any election will find time to give God the glory for the fact that they won and not, and, and not think that it's all because they're all that in a bag of nacho-flavored Doritos, okay? Greatest gift that you can give. Psalm 89, this is good. Uh, verse 20, do I have that one? Okay, thank you, man. I have found my servant David. This is the Lord speaking. With my holy oil I have anointed him with whom my hand will be established. Also my arm shall strengthen him. Now you and I, we're not David, but I want you to just take David out of there and put your name there. I have found my servant, Tim. I have found my servant, Chris. I have found my servant, Claudia. Whoever you are, with my holy oil, God says, I have anointed you. And then with you, my hand, my vision, my purpose, my kingdom, everything else, it's going to be established. So we don't pride ourselves in the fact that we're who God is using. I, quite, quite, quite honestly, uh, the reason why God uses us is that we're all he's got to use. And so he uses us because he has called us. He's called us for a purpose. Sometimes people say, well, I just feel so inferior. I've got an inferiority complex. So let me give you some good news and bad news. First of all, the bad news. The reason why you have an inferiority complex is because you are inferior. At that, that was supposed to be funny, but nevertheless, you are. You and I are. And the good news is we are all inferior, but we can do all things through Christ who has strengthened us. See, so it doesn't really have anything to do with my superiority or inferiority. It doesn't have anything to do with my ability. It has to do with his ability. But he does say to us, you're the instrument that I'm going to use to bring my will about. So I want you to begin to declare my will. Begin to speak my will over your family, over your church, over your community, over Cyprus, Magnolia, Tomball. I kept saying Cyprus, and some of our congregants came to me and said, don't forget the rest of Northwest Houston. So Hockley, uh, all of these other communities around us here, we need to speak that word. What was that word? That this actually, in the United States of America and possibly touching the whole world, will be a place of refuge. People will move here because it's going to be a good place to raise your kids and it's going to be a good place to be established and there's going to be safety in our streets. See, that we have to declare that. We say that. 
And I'm sharing that. I share that with community leaders. I share that with other pastors because I, I believe in that. I believe that that's part of our vision. Speak over our world. Speak over our family. Begin speaking over your children. If there's something about your children that you don't particularly like, begin to speak the Word of God over them. Begin to declare it. Declare uh, the, the Word of God. It's a great gift that you can, you can give them. And so God uses you. You know, this week, I went to the funeral of a dear friend of ours. We would, Delia and I did, as a matter of fact, Knoxville, Tennessee. We flew into Atlanta, drove up to Knoxville to attend the funeral of a dear friend of ours, Paul Cowell. And Paul died suddenly last Sunday morning. He was getting ready to go and preach, and he died in, uh, as he was getting ready for service. He'd had this lung uh, problem for a little while, and he succumbed quite quickly. It was really an act of God's grace on his behalf, actually. Paul was an amazing guy. He was a very dear friend. We loved him dearly. He had thousands of friends around the nation because he loved missions so much. And he would actually, he, he's the head of what they call the Christian Hospitality Network, and they put together retreats in all of the nations where they bring American missionaries together and treat them and wine and dine them for three days in five-star hotels. Just amazing. A lot of years ago, Paul Cowell was one of the founders of a Shop at Home ne Network, and so there was an amount of money that came to that, it came out of that, and he built... Uh, a five-star, four-diamond resort right on the Tennessee River, right on Watts Bar Lake called Whitestone Inn. And he would allow missionaries to come there and stay there during the week for nothing. And he was just an amazing guy, amazing guy. But there was a story that one of his friends said, told at the funeral. They were in Vancouver, Washington, and they were on vacation together, and they were... They were um, uh, going through, it's, it's a world famous gardens there, and I can't remember the name of the garden. Some of you from the Northwest may know and would, would, would know about it. But it was just amazing. The, the, it was just beautiful. I mean, it was awesome. And when they were leaving, he asked Paul, he said, well, what did you think about it, Paul? And he said, well, it makes me want to go home and mow my lawn. And you know, when you look at the big things, that David did, when you look at the big things the Apostle Paul did, when you look at the big things that Moses and Noah and all the rest of them did, you may think that your part is very, very small. Or what do I do today? Just mow the lawn. Today, it may just be a matter of taking a step. You know, there's an Old Testament scripture that says that the path of the just gets brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. And I take that to mean that as I make a step forward, I'm going to see things much better. God's given to you a vision, but as you step forward, that vision becomes more clear. So you move toward it. You move toward it by the things that you say and by the things that you speak. Let me move on to the next one here. Making a holy decree. Do we have that one up here? Did we get that one? Whoa, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't, I don't fully understand this, but I must have, uh, I really messed up. Okay, number three, making a holy decree is speaking the will of God. It's not a gesture of pride or presumption. It is essentially an act of humility and obedience. So, making that decree, speaking the will of God, is not pride or presumption. We don't go around bragging. The, you know, when Abraham got the word from the Lord that he was going to have a son when he's 100 years old. I mean, he didn't, he didn't make yard signs and go out and publicize it. Uh, we're going to have a son. We're going to have a son. We're going to have a son. But the, but the Bible does say that he held that confession close to his heart, and he declared what God had said over him. When we fail to speak up, when we fail to declare what is right and what is the truth, and what is God's will? That's not a gesture of humility. It's really a gesture of defeat and doubt and resignation and self-centeredness. Do we have Obadiah 1.1? This is a passage of Scripture that, that uh, pops up here from time to time in my mind. Because this was during the time that Israel went into captivity, and Obadiah 
was speaking to the nation of Edom after that, and he said, you deserted Israel in his time of need. You stood aloof, refusing to lift a finger to help when invaders carried off his wealth and divided Jerusalem among them by lot. You were as one of his enemies. Oh, isn't that an amazing statement? You saw what was happening, but you didn't say anything about it. We see lives that are falling apart, but we don't speak into that situation. We see situations taking place. We see devastation. We see destruction. And he says to them, you saw all this, but you didn't say anything. You didn't lift a finger to help them. So sometimes it's because it's, it's so what I'm saying here is that that means that when I see a situation, I need to speak the will of God into that situation. God is moved when I speak. When I declare the word of God into that situation, I release the hand of God to begin to, begin to work. So I remember there have been times in our lifetime together, I just remember one time specifically, maybe 20 years ago, when Delia went and I went out and we were walking right where my son now lives in, uh, in Chesterfield, Missouri, right outside of St. Louis. We were walking together on the evening. And um, we were both a little bit discouraged. And I remember turning, she remembers this as well. I turned to her and I said, Delia, your best days are ahead of you. And she said, Paul, your best days are ahead of you. And we just began to declare, we began to speak out of what we knew to be true. There are times when you just need to humble yourself and speak God's truth about yourself. Quit putting yourself down. That's a, that, that is passive aggression. As well. well, look, I did it again. That's just me. Don't you know? Don't do that to yourself. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There's times when you get, you get aggravated with yourself, and I think it's also you say it loud enough so somebody else will hear you and just feel a little bit sorry for you. And we all feed off of a little bit of self-pity, and, uh, but, but, but don't do that. Begin to speak God's word. You know what was amazing about Jesus? Jesus simply said what the Father said about him. You begin to say what God has said about you. You begin to declare God's will over your life just as he has given it to you. And if God has given to you a vision, you declare that thing. Sometimes we say, well, Lord, would you just please say something? And God says to us, I want you to go ahead and say what I've already given you to say. Give me something to work with. This is not name it and claim it. But it's with the confession of your mouth, putting into action what is God's idea for your life. And you might say, well, what if I declare the wrong thing? Don't worry, it won't come to pass. It won't happen. But the right thing will come to pass. You know, you can be in certain places and not realize that God wants to do something. And so you need to be, we need to be cognizant. God wants to do something here. Let me go to number four. And again, we don't have it up there, so just write this down. God does not give vision to put you under stress, but give you hope-filled direction. He, do, he, doesn't, he doesn't give it to, to, to put you under stress, okay? Because sometimes people will say, God's given me this vision, and oh, I'm just really under the burden and the load. No, he doesn't give you a vision. Because you speak and he disposes. You are the one who says. You are the one who decrees. But God is the one who establishes. So with the establishing part, that's God's problem. It's not my problem. There are three things that really need to line up any time that you get a vision from God. Number one, the Word of God. Number two, the Holy Spirit. Number three, the circumstances. Just remember that. And that would have been up there too had I updated this, uh, this. But remember that, that it's, the, it's, first of all, the Word of God. God will not tell you to do anything. He will not give you a vision outside of the Word of God. He will not give you a vision without also impressing upon your spirit that this is right. Somebody may give you a word, 
and it just contradicts everything that God has already spoken to you. Well, you agree with the Holy Spirit, and you stand strong with God, what God has already impressed upon your spirit. And number three, circumstances. So sometimes you just have to wait for it. Like the Scripture in Habakkuk, the vision is for an appointed time. Wait upon it, and it will come, and it will come to pass, and it will not tarry. At that moment, I think it was Tim or somebody a minute ago saying that if you keep on doing the right thing, it will happen. But the key is continuing to do the, the right thing. I know it was a young man a few years ago came to me, and he said, I've just really been declaring the Word of God over my, my future marriage. And I said, okay, tell me about it. He told me about this girl. Well, I looked at him, and I knew her, and I knew it wasn't a match. You know, sometimes, you know, it just ain't a match. I'm not going to say that he was uglier than homemade mud, but he was, but he just didn't have all together. She's a very beautiful, she's very talented, she's going places, and I knew she's going to go places without him. Uh, but he had, God given this vision, he's going to marry her. And I said, well, have you, he said, I keep declaring it. <laughs> I keep decreeing it. Well, it's outside of God's will for his life. And he had to understand that. He needed to, to learn that. And so we need to hear the right vision. We need to see the right vision. We need to hear the right word. And then when we speak that word, we speak it according to God's word. It's not going to, it's not going to go outside of God's word. God may make you a millionaire, but you won't get it by squandering other people of their millions because that would be outside the realm of God's Word. And the Holy Spirit, there's going to be that understanding that this is the call, and then circumstances have to fall into place in order for this to come to pass because many times there are extenuating circumstances and we don't understand those. But see, your cooperation with the will of God is not dependent upon your comprehension. You don't have to know exactly how it's going to come to pass. Last night, I was on the plane from Dallas to here. We came from Atlanta to Dallas home. And I was sitting there, I thought, oh, hey, I've got a great window seat. And I looked out, and all I can see is that big engine. But I started studying that engine. That, that engine on that 737 is a pretty sizable piece of equipment. And I thought to myself, what all is going on inside of that thing? It's well painted. It looks nice on the outside. But that's not what it's all about. There are gears. There's working mechanisms on the inside of this that engineers understand. I don't understand it. Someone else understands this. I don't understand it. But I got home. I got home safe. It worked. Thank God it worked. And it took off. And it landed, and it did those back jets thing, and we came to a halt and got out. You see, I didn't have to understand that airplane in order to get on it last night. You don't have to understand the way that God is going to do what he has promised to do. You don't, because your, your comprehension is not the guiding force here. It's your cooperation, no matter what your comprehension is. Let me give to you another one here. In fact, this will be my last one. Train yourself to speak from truth, not from emotion. Don't speak from emotion. Remember that. I think that this is very important because sometimes we speak out of emotion rather than out of truth. We either get mad we get discouraged, we either get mad, we get sad, we get glad, we get been had, or whatever. And we speak out of that emotion rather than out of what thus saith the Lord. So what has God said? What is God saying? We're going to speak that. We're going to declare that. We're going to say what God says, and we're going to say what God wants us to say. There's an interesting story that comes out of Numbers, the 20th chapter. And the, uh, the Bible tells us that, um, well, the people were complaining. People are in the wilderness. They're complaining there's no water. They are thirsty, and they are starving. The animals are thirsty, and they are starving. And they began to complain to Moses. 
And Moses takes this to the Lord, and the Lord says to him, I, I want you to do this. I want you to go before the people, gather the people, and I want you to go to this rock, and I want you to speak to this rock. And when you speak to the rock, water is going to come out of this rock, and the people are going to be well fed. It's going to be wonderful. Watch what happens to Moses. And do we have Numbers 20 there? We don't have that one. Thank you. Uh, everybody, uh, just right now, give Caitlin a big hand because she's had, to, she's had to handle my old version before I added all of this in. If I did, uh, the Lord only knows. Numbers, the 20th chapter, verse 10, says that he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, this is Moses. God says, I want you to go out and bless the people. And he says, to, and, and so he gets up and says, listen, you, um, you insolent ingrates, you, you rebels, must we bring water to you out of this rock? And then Moses raised his hand. I like where the Bible just says he raised his hand and he struck the rock twice with his staff. You want you to know, I want you to know that this is not one of those uh, Hollywood Exodus movies here where he tops it and speaks in English to it, you know. Rock, give up your water, whatever. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community in the land that I give them. Now watch this. We have a choice. We can act out of anger or we can speak out of the word of God. God gave him a word to speak, but when Moses got up there, he was so aggravated, he was so angry that he smote. Now I think I probably cannot illustrate to you exactly how Moses did this, but I think that he's knocked the gee willikers out of that rock with his staff. I think that he tested the strength of his staff. He hit that thing out of anger. We've got to do this. You have been rebellious against God. Now we've got to do this. And because of that, God was displeased. Now we have a choice. We can either get in the flesh and strike out of the situation around us in the name of righteous indignation, or we can speak the word of God to the situation. I encourage you to speak the word of God to the situation. And one will produce bitterness, the other one will produce life. You can get, uh, you, you can get into bitter confusion or you can get into life-giving joy. Now let me read one passage of Scripture as we are closing today. Romans, the 10th chapter, the 6th verse. This is uh, something that we use quite often as we are encouraging people and teaching people how to receive Christ. And I want you to listen very closely to this. But the righteousness that is faith of faith does not say, watch this, who will ascend into heaven. Now let me just tell you something. The Bible is to be understood, not to be, un not to be misunderstood. And this sounds like a lot of uh, theology to us, but listen to it very closely. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. In other words, the faith declaring what God has said is not a matter of getting him to come into our situation. He's already here. Or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you it is in your mouth it is in your heart you got that if you declare with your mouth jesus is lord and believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved so you believe in your heart and do what you declare with your mouth for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now, a lot of people are ready to bring their lives to the Lord, but they're concerned about their own condition. They're concerned about 
the sins that they still have operating in their lives. I just want to tell you this morning that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ took care of the sin problem. He took care of it once and for all. He went to the cross, and what did he do? All of those faults, failures, idiosyncrasies, shortcomings, mistakes, and everything else that we call sin, he bore those things. He took them to the cross. And when he took them to the cross and he died, then the sin died too. He already dealt with it. The result of sin, we still live with in this world. But your salvation is not predicated upon whether you sin or not. Your salvation is predicated upon whether you believe that the price that he paid on Calvary's hill paid for those sins and took care of those sins. You got it? So that's why, that doesn't mean we continue in sin. We don't do that. But, but the more that we walk with him, we see that that stuff starts falling away. But today, if there's something, I, I just sense there may be someone here today saying, you know, I would come to Jesus. I'd give my life to the Lord. I would do all of that stuff. But I've just got so much junk I'm bringing. I, I, so much junk from my past. So much junk from my presence. Listen, you can move beyond all of that today. And how do you do it? You do it by saying what you believe in your heart. See, to me, the saddest thing in the world for me to, to, would be to speak to people who really do have faith, who really do believe, you know, in their heart. All the, I, I believe this message. I just can't get saved. Now, I, I want you to take that step today. Move beyond just believing it. Do you believe today that Jesus Christ went, came into this world, bore all of our sins, and took them with him to that tree and died in our behalf and that shed his blood so that our sins might be forgiven? Do you believe that? Then if you believe that, I want you to declare it today. And when you declare it, what do you do? You set into motion this very thing that he calls salvation here. With your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Everybody say saved. It is so good. I'm telling you, they didn't preach that to me when I was a kid. I was already in the ministry when I came to understand this. And one day, 25 years of age, already been in ministry for a few years Early in my life, I was driving down the road and understood that I'm not only saved, but I'm safe. And he's got me in his arms, and he's not going to let me go. Isn't it great to know that you're safe in him? Come on, let's stand together. Yeah, let's give God a good pen clap together. Thank you, Father.